Well, good morning, everyone. And uh, welcome also to those of you who are online. If you've got your phone with you, this is a great time to pull it out and uh, share this uh, live stream on your Facebook or start a watch party and uh, let God use you to grow his kingdom. That's a great, it's a great thing for you to be a part of. Uh, I was in India a number of years ago in India with Pastor Billy Graham Pelosi and, and uh, he leads a, a ministry that we support there. And I was surprised to discover that they print their government documents in 22 different languages. In India, they tell me that they have over 1,600 languages and dialects that are spoken. Uh, William Carey, a wonderful man of God that we'll get to meet one day in heaven. Uh, God gifted him so greatly that he was able to translate the Bible into 34 different languages during his lifetime in India. I mean, that's astounding. He could speak uh, all of those languages. I went to a remote tribal village in North India, uh, Northeast India, and, and um, in Orissa State, and this there was a, a small church, a group of believers. I think there were 21 there when uh, people when I was there. The gospel had only come to this village about 10 years before, and uh, radical Hindus had attacked these Christians. They actually cut down these huge trees over the top of the road so that rescue people, police couldn't come in to save them, and they attacked them with clubs and machetes. They killed four. The others were able to escape into the forest where they hid out for 18 days waiting for help to come. So we went, and, and uh, as a part of your giving, uh, you know, we support missions, and we took money to the widows uh, who were there. And I had an opportunity to preach to this, to this young church of believers and they spoke a tribal language and no one who spoke English there spoke the tribal language but uh, most Indians speak Hindi these tribal people didn't speak Hindi either but we had a, a man there who spoke the tribal language and who spoke Hindi and so as I was preaching I would say it in English and then another man would say it in Hindi and then a third man would say it in the tribal language. But our team was from South India, and they only spoke Tamil. And so a fourth man had to say it in Tamil. So every sentence went, went from English to Hindi to the tribal language to Tamil. And, uh, you know, boy, preaching a message like that, it can only be the Holy Spirit, right, to, to get it. But, but it's amazing. Everyone listened so attentively. It was just beautiful. We had the great privilege as a church. In fact, we still support them. They're with Wycliffe translators uh, in, in the recruiting department now. But Wes and Leanne Reed, right out of college, young couple, uh, given their lives to the Lord. And they went to Papua New Guinea in order to take the Bible uh, to an unreached people group. And so Wes had to learn the Yopno language. It's really a funny language. He speaks it when he comes a little bit for us. And it has popping sounds clucking kind of with your tongue in the, in, in the language, but he had to learn that. Then he, they had no written language, so then he had to create an alphabet and create a written language, and they spent 25 years there. He translated the entire New Testament, and I think the book of Isaiah, into the Yopno language, and he showed us a film of when they delivered these New Testaments, and the rejoicing and the dancing. I mean, it was so fabulous, these people having the Scripture in their language. Another man, a uh, uh, missionary named Otto Koenig, went to Papua New Guinea to a tribe of headhunters uh, to take the gospel. And uh, he was angry all the time because this particular tribe valued theft, stealing, and they taught their children to steal at a very young age. And they were stealing stuff from him all the time. He was just mad all the time. And, and uh, what happened is uh, he went out to a pastor's conference. He'd been there four years, I think, and he went out to a pastor's conference and he got saved. Um, that's a true story, okay? He believed in the Bible. He believed that Jesus was the Messiah. He'd given his life to ministry, and he wasn't saved. Didn't know it until he went out to that conference, and, uh, and, and he got saved and changed his ministry. Anyway, he, he, his first, the first man that he ever led to the Lord, this young chief, and I shared before that, that this man ended up dying uh, um, a short while later, but, but one day this young chief was looking kind of dejected, and he asked him what was going on, and the chief said to him, Tulan, I don't want to go to heaven. And he said, well, wh why, would you, why would you say that? And he said, because I'm the only one of my people who's a Christian. He said, if I go to heaven, I won't have anybody to talk to. And uh, Koenig says, no, you don't understand. In heaven, 
everyone will speak the same language. And he lit up and he said, you mean in heaven everybody's going to speak my language? You know, uh, he was excited. Well, what is the deal with all these languages? Because according to evolutionary theory, there should only be one language. Because the first people who communicated, their children would have learned to communicate from them, and they would have communicated that way, and they would have taught their children to communicate, and there wouldn't be any reason to ever communicate a different way, except when you need to Google, you might invent a new word, right? To Google, or you might change the meaning of a word like mouse, but there would be, the structure would all be the same, the language would be the same, and there would be just one language. Where did it all come from? Well, we're in week four of this series called The Greatest Story Ever Told. Week one was about creation. Week two, about Adam and Eve. Last week, we learned some great lessons for fathers from Noah. And this week, we're looking at the Tower of Babel. We'll be in Genesis chapter 11. If you have a Bible with you, I encourage you to follow along. And we'll start with verse one there. Now, the whole world had one language and a common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves so we won't be scattered over the face of the whole earth. Now, this Tower of Babel incident occurred over 4,000 years ago. It was at least 100 years after the flood of Noah. It was before Abraham was born. Someone actually found an ancient stone tablet with a drawing etched on it of the Tower of Babel. Uh, this uh, stone is at least, if we can get a picture of it, it's at least 2,500 years old. And it shows that's just a, a clear illustration of what is etched on that stone. Uh, and, uh, and so when you think of the Tower of Babel, what you need to think of is kind of like a massive coliseum that would have been divided into many, many rooms. In fact, just on the first level, there, there may have been, uh, there, there could have been a thousand or thousands of dwelling places, homes as well as businesses. You're, you're talking about a coliseum like that, and then you add a level. And then you add another level. And then you add another level. So we're talking about a, a city tower. You're not, you're not talking about who can put the tallest spire on top of a building somewhere in a city so that they can claim they beat it by seven feet and now it's the tallest building in the world. That's not what this was. This was, this was like a, a massive, massive structure that, uh, that would have been utilized uh, in a very real sense, okay, in their, in their daily lives, not something that was simply done as, as a monument. Okay, we, we believe that the man in charge of this was Nimrod, uh, who was Noah's great-grandson. Now, Nimrod cut a wide swath. He was a man's man. When he walked down the street, everybody would have taken notice. In fact, the Bible says in Genesis 10 that he was a mighty warrior before the Lord, and it also says he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. And we also learn that, the, that he had a kingdom, okay? So he was a leader, and that the center of his kingdom was the plains of Shinar, which is exactly where this tower was built. Now, why would God have such a big problem with people building the world's largest structure? Well, we're going to take a look. Let's go back to verse 4 once more. Then they said, come let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we can make a name for ourselves so we won't be scattered over the face of the whole earth. Well, there's two big problems contained in this little verse. The first is the sin of pride. Who are they trying to glorify through building this? God? No, no, themselves. We want to make a name for ourselves. You know, uh, imagine if you could hear insects talk, and one of them is this tiny little insect, and it lives on one square foot of ground its entire life, but it's the biggest thing it's ever seen. And then imagine that little thing saying, I'm the king of the world, right? I mean, we just think, that's just ludicrous, okay? But as far as that thing, it's the king of the world, right? It's got its little empire. And I think, you, you know, God looking down from heaven when he sees people wanting to lift and build themselves up, it, it has that same kind of magnitude to it. Like, that's just got to be the silliest thing ever. The angels in heaven have to just, you know, be in disbelief. How can they think about making a name for themselves? They're a little bug on a square foot of ground, Right? It, it's, it's not it, right? But, but we're, we're like that. We can be. And, and that, you know, but the bug believes it anyway, right? Because here we are, we're, we're only two generations away from the flood. 
because Noah and his sons were on it, and we're talking now about a, a son's grandson, Noah's great-grandson, Nimrod. So we're just two generations from the flood. Ham, the son of Noah, had a grandson, Nimrod, who has who, uh, is, is got a kingdom and, and wants to be the king of the world. He wants his name the, the, uh, to be held in awe, to be the most famous name on earth. But people's view is so limited you know, we, we get wrapped up in ourselves, and, and what happens is if I get wrapped up enough in myself, I don't have any room for God, and that's kind of the way they are. Now listen, the, the Apostle Peter was once interrogated by a group of religious hypocrites after he had healed a man, and, and this is what he responded, and this has to do with a name, with making a name for ourselves. He said this in Acts 4, 10 through 12. He said, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Look at this, verse 12. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. And in Acts 2.38, Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the Holy Spirit. Philippians 2, 8 through 11, and being found in appearance as a man, Jesus humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen? See, and these ants living on the plains of Shinar, these ants living in America, in Seattle, in Alaska, they want to make a name for themselves. Let me tell you something, it's not going to happen. There's one name that's going to receive glory, and every knee is going to bow. And friends, if you want to bring fame on the earth, then make Jesus famous. All right, make Jesus famous. Anything else is pride, and pride is a path to a world of hurt. Okay, that's what pride is. Proverbs 16, 18 says, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. So let's go back to the tower. God had a big problem with it because it was intended to glorify man instead of glorify God. But there was another big problem. When Noah and his family left the ark, God gave them both a blessing and instructions. All right, this is what God said to them in Genesis 9, 1. Then God blessed Noah and his sons, saying to them, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. Now that word fill, it's the Hebrew word malay, and it means to fill to all fullness, to fill completely. That's what it means. And so God said to them, I'm blessing you right now. I'm going to make you fruitful, and I want you to have children. I want you to grow your families, and I want you to spread out and fill the earth. That's what God said to them, all right? And here we are in Genesis 11:4. What did we read? Let's look at it once more. They said to ourselves, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Why? So we won't be scattered over the whole earth. They knew, all right, because their father knew and their grandfather had received the command. They'd received the blessing and command from God were to spread out. And they said, no, wait, let's build this tower so we don't have to spread out. We won't be scattered. We'll be all in one place. And so what we have here now is the second great sin, which is the sin of rebellion. God told them, scatter, fill the whole earth. The people said, let's build a tower, make ourselves famous, keep us all in one place. Right, essentially God said go, and the people said no. All right, that's what's happening right here. And rebellion and pride are very serious sins. In 1 Samuel 15, 23, we read, For rebellion is like the sin of witchcraft, and insolence like the evil of idolatry. You know, we often apply this to uh, teenagers because that's one of the first stages in life when we start exerting our independence and very often rebellion, but it's equally applicable to adults at any stage of life. It, listen, rebellion is a serious, serious thing in God's eyes. Insolence, a bad attitude. Okay, those are big things in God's eyes because they are, again, they're, stirred, they're, they're rooted in pride. And pride and rebellion are the very sins, okay, that led for Satan himself to be cast out of heaven. Both of these attitudes, pride and rebellion, let me tell you where they lead. They lead straight to hell. They lead straight to hell. That's where those attitudes lead. Ezekiel 33:11, God says this, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, 
but rather that they turn from their ways and live. See, Noah's grandchildren were already turning completely away from God. And, and God loved them too much to not intervene. And when you start turning away from God, he loves you too much to not intervene. And the world is going to come crashing right down on you, and it's just a matter of time. It's just a world of hurt. That because, why? Because he loves you. And he loved these people too much. They were already far from God. They said, we don't need him. Look at what we can do. We'll make a name for ourselves. We don't have to leave here. We don't have to fill the earth. We'll stay right here. God loved them too much. Why? Because their pride and rebellion was leading them to hell. God said, I can't let this pass. I can't let this go. The biggest favor I can do them is to mess up their plans and completely interrupt their lives. Well, where, where did they go? They went everywhere. Verse 5, Genesis 11. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. And the Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language they become to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down. Remember the Father and Jesus Christ was right there and the Holy Spirit was right there. Let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there all over the earth and they stopped building the city. That is why it was called Babel because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. Well, where did they go? They went everywhere. And interestingly, Noah's grandson, Javan, that's uh, Ionia. And Ionia, Javan, anytime you see that uh, in the Old Testament, if you see the word Greece, that's actually the word Javan. It's the name for Noah's grandson. He was, the, he was the one who founded Greece. Another grandson of Noah is Mizraim. And anytime in the Old Testament, in Hebrew, that you see the word translated in English, Egypt, Egypt is the word Mizraim. And so where did they go? Well, one went to Greece. One went, uh, okay, to, to Egypt. And, and the others went all kinds of places. In fact, Genesis 10 which we call the Table of Nations, it documents uh, 70 nations or language groups spreading out to fill the earth and, uh, of course, prodded, obviously, by the lack of ability to communicate with each other. In my mind, you know, thinking about how I am and people, you know, people never really change. Uh, I think what happened, you know, in that moment in time, suddenly there's only ever been one language and suddenly people are shouting out and, and you just don't understand it. But then, man, you understand one person over there and you guys gravitate to each other and, and another person hears and, and comes in and this is happening and all these groups and people are getting together and pretty soon you're all standing standing in groups and you're looking at the other group and they're saying stuff and you don't get it. And, and, and I think probably what happened is, is someone said, man, what are they talking about? And then somebody else says, I think they want to take our stuff, right? I mean, I, I, you know, yeah, I don't trust them, you know, and this is what happens, right? Language is created, distrust uh, amongst people, a lack of understanding, and, and, and we've been having battles and, uh, you know, over territory and conflict ever since. It didn't have to be that way, right? But that's simply the way that it is. How hard was it for God to confuse all the languages of the world? He just spoke the word, right? And he did it. Not hard at all. How hard would it be for God to bring all the languages back to one? Wouldn't be hard at all. He'd just speak a word. In fact, he did speak that word at one point in history. In Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard his own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus in Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own languages. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? What does this mean? 
Why would God disrupt your day? Why would he topple the little kingdom that you've been building? What does this mean? Why would God speak in a way that you can understand? Well, what does it mean? Why, why would God take drastic measures at times to get your attention? What does it mean? Why would God do that? Why, why would he intervene? Why would he disrupt your plans? Why would he topple the tower that you're building? Well, Jesus told us why in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world because he loves you. Because that he, uh, he understands if he's not at the center, it's because you're at the center. And if you're on the center, you're on a path to hell. And he loves you too much to allow that to go unchecked. He loves you too much for that. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. If you want a recipe for a blessed life, Okay, God gives us that in Colossians 3.17. This would be a great scripture verse for you all to memorize. Okay, this is a, this is a good one, okay, to have tattooed on your arm. And don't, don't go and get a tattoo and say, the pastor told me to get a tattoo. Okay, listen, Colossians 3.17. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Whatever you do, whether in word, conversation, you're speaking, or deed, what your actions, all, all in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks. Now listen, whatever you do on Friday night, on Saturday night, whatever you do when you're with your friends, whatever you do when nobody else is at home, when, when, when you're in private in your room, whatever you do, if you can't do it in the name of Jesus giving thanks, to the glory of God the Father, then you shouldn't be doing it. Because whatever you do, whatever you do, whatever you do, however you speak, it should be in the name of Jesus, giving thanks. All right, you live that way. You want a recipe for a blessed life? Boy, read this, meditate on it, ask God to help you to live this way. You will see dramatic changes for the better immediately. Stop glorifying you and start glorifying the name. There's just one name. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. There is no other name given under heaven by which we must be saved. One name. Jesus prayed, Father, glorify your name, the name you gave me. That's Jesus and what are the names of God? We're going to give glory to the names. He is the Alpha and Omega, Abba Father, our Advocate, the Almighty, our All in All, and the Ancient of Days. He is the Anointed One, the Author of our Salvation, the Bread of Life, the Breath of Life, the Bridegroom, and the Bright Morning Star. He is the Chief Shepherd, the Chosen One, our Comforter, Cornerstone, Counselor, and Creator. He is the Crown of Beauty, a Consuming Fire. He is Christ the Lord. He is our Deliverer and our Dwelling Place. He is Emmanuel, Everlasting Father, Faithful and True. He is the Firstborn and the Firstfruits, our Fortress and Foundation, the Fountain of Living Waters. He is a gentle whisper. He is God Almighty, the God who sees me, our great high priest. He is the head of the church, our hiding place, the Holy One of Israel, our hope, and the horn of our salvation. He is the great I Am, Jehovah, Judge, King of Glory, and King of Kings. He is the Lamb of God, the Lawgiver, the Light of the World, and the Lion of the tribe of Judah. He is our living water, Lord God Almighty, Lord of Glory, Lord of the Harvest, Lord of Hosts, and Lord of Lords. He is our Maker, a Man of Sorrows our mediator, our merciful God and Messiah. He is the Nazarene, the offspring of David, the only begotten son, and the Passover lamb. He is the great physician, 
our portion, the Prince of Peace and the radiance of God's glory. He is our Redeemer, our Refuge, the Righteous One, our Rock, the Root of David and the Ruler of God's creation. He is Savior, Servant, Shepherd, Shield and the Star out of Jacob. He is our Strength and Strong Tower, the Son of Righteousness, the Son of Man and the Son of God. He is our teacher, the true witness and the true light. He is the vine, a wall of fire, the wisdom of God, the way, the truth, and the life. Ascribe to the Lord the glory to his name. Amen? Amen. Amen. And I don't want to build a tower to lift my name. And the only thing important about my name is that it be written in the Lamb's book of life. Other than that, my name means nothing. And I'm not going to live for my name. I'm going to live for the glory of his name. He's the Lord, but is he your Lord? He's the Savior, but is he your Savior? I had a chance to speak with our TLDs. This is that group of young people who have given their summer to be intensively discipled. They're living here at the church. And one of the things that I talked with them about is, is the simple reality that in any, in any particular river, it's full of fish. And a lot of the fish are swimming in the same direction, but they're not all the same kind of fish. Now, that's the way that it is in the church. It's the way it is in every youth group. It's the way it is in every Bible teaching church. And it's the way it is here today. What you have is you have everybody swim in the same direction. In other words, you know what? I think this is a good thing. I think, you know, that, that church is a good thing. I'm agreeing that Jesus, I think he's the son of God. I think the Bible's true. I'm, everybody's swimming this way. But what happens is many, many people... I'm talking collectively. I'm talking nationally. Many, many people have never been born again. They've never been transformed. The Bible says if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone. And, and if you're a new creation, then it's true for you that you love what Jesus loves and you hate what Jesus hates. And if that's not true for you, then you're not a new creation. You're just not. And God forbid, we, we, we give an invitation, we'll give one today every single week. And millions of people have a life testimony that my friend, my neighbor, my pastor, some visiting evangelist, somebody shared the gospel, I prayed to receive Christ and my life was changed to the glory of God. Thank you, Jesus, for that testimony. But it is equally true that just because you get down and say a prayer doesn't mean you're saved. Have you been changed? Do you love the church? That's his bride. You say, well, you know, I'm a, I'm a Christian. I just don't care much for church. Oh, I, 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 I'm good friends with the groom. I can't stand the bride. Invite me to the wedding. You don't like the bride, and you're telling me you love the groom? You don't like the bride, and you want to come to the wedding? You're not invited. Well, you're invited. You're just not going to come. Okay? Not like that. If you, if you, if you love Jesus, you love the church. I'm talking about the church that belongs to him, and if you love Jesus, you'll be able to distinguish very quickly whether or not a church belongs to him. What else? You love Jesus. What else are you going to love? You're going to love the Word of God. You love Jesus, you're going to love prayer. You're going to want to pray. Why? Because you've been created new. You've been changed. Do you know what that news smells like? That good, that's, that's called good news, all right? God so loved the world that he gave. You know what it smells like? To, to those who have a hard heart, who are perishing, it stinks like death. The Bible says that it smells like judgment to those who are perishing. It's the aroma of death, but it's the aroma of life to those who are being saved. If you have a tender heart, if you want the Lord, if you're interested in the Lord, you start hearing things that come, truth from Scripture, and it smells like life. And you go, wait a minute, man, do I need that? Wait, is there something I'm missing? Wait, wait, what is this? It smells like, I remember, I was living like hell. 
doing every rotten thing that a young guy out on his own could be doing. No interest in the Bible, no interest in God, no interest in church. But when somebody opened this up and began to share the gospel clearly, it was like, wait, 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 because it smelled like life. I said, Could this be true? It smells like life for you. It's because the Holy Spirit's working in your heart and telling you what you already know, and that is that it is true. That you're a sinner who desperately needs to be forgiven and rescued and saved. And it is by faith in Jesus Christ. When they say believe in the name, the name Jesus, that's a Greek word. Translated, it's Iesus. Iesus, and it means the Lord saves. You have to believe the Lord saves. And all you need to do is come to him, confessing what you and God already know to be true, that you're a sinner and asking him to forgive you. The promise of God is that he will turn away none of those who come by faith. If you've prayed this prayer before and your life hasn't changed, then there's something that you've put in God's way. And all you need to do is wrestle through that. You do need to wrestle through it. Because the Lord will change you. And the Holy Spirit will take up residence and confirm in you that you know, that you know, that you know, that you're a child of God. And you'll notice that your priorities change. Your language change. Your habits change. The things that are important to you change because you're going to begin to love those things that Jesus loves and hate those things that Jesus hates. If you need that, okay, don't, don't, Don't leave that laying on the table undealt with. You need to deal with that up front with the Lord and say, God, I put something in your way. I, I, I recognize, Lord, I'm not changed. I have prayed. I do believe. I have faith, but I'm not changed. What is it? What is it that I've put in your way? He'll share. He'll show you. He'll show you because he's eager to answer that prayer to be forgiven to be saved and for some of you you've just never asked him and you recognize maybe for the first time you recognize this morning that you do believe you do have faith you believe he's the messiah you believe that he told the truth and you're ready you're ready to come to him saying lord jesus forgive me save me And if that's you, we want to give you that opportunity right now. We'll pray along with you. Just bow and pray this simple prayer of faith. Jesus, I do believe you're the Son of God. I believe that you died on a cross to pay for my sins and the sins of the whole world. And I believe you rose again. I confess to you, Jesus, that I'm a sinner. I've said and done things that are wrong. I know I'm guilty. I'm asking you, please forgive me. I'm asking you to come into my heart and life and change me. I'm asking you to make me brand new. I'm asking you to adopt me to be a child of God. And here and now, Jesus, because you promise, not because I'm good enough, but because you're good enough and you promise, I'm receiving the gift that you offer, forgiveness and a brand new life. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for saving me. Speak to me now and show me how to live in a way that pleases you.